All right. So individual variations in drug response. This has to do with food and drug interactions, drug and drug interactions, drug and herb interactions. Could be, have to do with your age, your race, your genetic makeup, whether you're young, whether you're old, whatever. Okay, so we'll talk about all those things. So what do you know about potentiation and inhibition? Anybody know what those words mean? Yes? Yeah, so if you potentiate, you heighten the effect. So taking one drug with another drug makes that the first drug work better. A good example of that is a drug called Percocet or Vicodin. Both of those drugs do the same kind of thing. So you, Percocet and Vicodin have a narcotic in them and they have Tylenol in them. The Tylenol makes the, the narcotic work better or potentiates it. Drug-food interactions are also a problem. Has anybody met a person who takes a blood thinner called Coumadin or Warfarin? What food can they not eat? Leafy green. green leafy vegetables because it has vitamin K in it and it causes increased clotting. And so it diminishes the effect of the Coumadin. So we have to teach our patients. And so that's one thing that you need to start getting out of these lectures that we go through is anything that I tell you is potential to teach your patient about. Because at the end of the day, you're the last person that sees them before they go home. So we make sure that they know what they're doing and they're safe. Drug herb, herb or herb, should I say herb or herb? Which is better? Herb. herb. When, I, when fancy smancy people talk, they say herbs. <laughs> but we'll just be regular, okay? <laughs> so the herb interaction. So St. John Wort is a classic. People take St. John Wort for depression. But if you take it for several, day, or for several months and then go have surgery, you're at increased risk for bleeding. I mean, hemorrhaging is bad, right? So you don't want to hemorrhage. So you teach your patient... Don't take St. John's wort before surgery. Okay? Make sense? So, oh, here's the first question. Let me pause. Okay, so let's talk about drug and drug interactions. When you're in the hospital and you're taking care of patients, your patients are going to be taking lots of drugs. How can you tell if they're safe? What will you do? Yeah, so you can do some research and do look it up in the book or, or a drug manual that's allowed in the hospital. Yeah, we're going to talk about that. So we're worried about precipitate. If you put two um, medications in the same syringe and give it to a person, if they're not compatible, they form crystals. And crystals are kind of sharp, right? So you don't want to insert sharp crystals into somebody's blood vessels. That's bad. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to figure out how to, how to treat patients. So here's the question. I've already kind of got the answer, but um, you want to go to Socrative and do that? or is All right. So Google's not a trusted source for patient treatment. So we're going to do an activity. I asked you to bring your laptop because you're going to go on the Internet, and you're going to look up these two drugs and see, can you give them IV together? And so go to the JMU library. So Google JMU library. This time you can Google. You go to the nursing subject guide. And under the nursing subject guide, you go to diseases and drugs and find LexiComp. My laptop's over in the That's OK. You can do that on that. And you just need your, that's your JMU ID to get in. If it asks for your ID, it's just your JMU ID and password. You can make your screen bigger, right? Like no, that. it's just like I have a focus problem, so I have to have glasses on to read things in front of me. Okay. Question? Okay, so the question over here is will the LexiComp app work? Because I said I'd like you to get that. Well, guess what? The JMU library tells me that they don't, have a, um, sub they don't have a subscription through the app, but only through the web. 
I'm finding out a lot of little discrepancies. So if you go in through the web, you can go in through JMU to LexiComp and use the resource. So we have to like, go specifically see the librarian to get the LexiComp set up if we're not even on campus. Um, because sometimes we can't access. You'll have to have the VPN or Junos VPN server set up for on your iPad. And I can talk to you about how to do that later, or you can call the library. Okay, so is everybody at LexiComp? No. No? Is it under medical apps? So under disease, drugs and diseases, near the top, are you at the first go to nursing subject guide? Yep. Under, there's the subject guide of nursing, and then there's some dots underneath of it, and then there's nursing again. That's the one. I'm trying to get to it, and it's not. It's not letting you in? Yeah. Okay. Well, look one of friends. Okay. Is it? It might be that everybody, I'm asking 90 people to get on the internet at the same time. Okay. So when you're in clinical and you get your patient information, and we ask you to do those SIM chart data stuff, you're going to need drug information. This is one way to get it. So what I want you to do is click on, if you're here at this page, you want to click on IV compatibility. So click on IV compatibility right here. It's not letting us click. Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, we're going to talk about drug and drug interactions. Um, I talked, I mentioned a little bit already about certain drugs that work together to make, you know, make things work better. So these drugs are going to go to a specific receptor site, and at that specific receptor site, they're going to cause a reaction or mimic what the normal physiology is, or they're going to block a reaction or block the normal physiology, right? So some of the things that's going to happen is we're going to give some drugs together, and they're going to cause the opposite reaction. A time I can think that I've done this is when I had a patient overdose on opioids. So a patient who overdoses on opioids, is take, that drug is called an opioid agonist. So it mimics the normal physiologic response and decreases the central nervous system. You get decreased pain response. But with that, you also get decreased level of consciousness, Sleepiness, for you yawners, I'm sleepy too, right? Um, decreased respiration, so you're really at high risk for things, um, for adverse reactions. So if you overdose on that, you could stop breathing. You won't wake up, that kind of thing. So you give an opioid agonist if they overdose on it? So the opioid agonist is the drug they overdose on, the morphine, for instance. So if their patients come in and they're overdosed on it, what I would give is an opioid antagonist, and that's called Narcan. And so that's going to compete with the site, the receptor sites, and block the morphine effect. So to inhibit the metabolism and the uptake of that morphine. There's an, actually a, a little paragraph in your book about that exact thing. Okay? So here's just a little clinical pearl. This is something that you might encounter in practice. So in practice, um, a lot of times we'll have patients in the hospital for long periods of time. Um, in this particular situation, you have somebody who's been in the hospital after 10 days, and they were intubated and ventilated for six days. So you know what intubated means? Yes. So breathing tube down their th um, trachea and ventilated something, the machine's breathing for them. While somebody's on those machines, we give them drugs to kind of paralyze them and keep them still so they don't accidentally pull it out right? That drug can cause a problem. It could be in the class of drugs called barbiturates. And if you're giving a patient Coumadin or a blood thinner and the barbiturate, they're going to need a lot more Coumadin while they're taking the barbiturate, right? And then when you send them home, they're not obviously ventilated anymore. They're not getting the paralytic drug anymore. Then the amount of Coumadin you've been giving them is too much. They are at risk for hemorrhage now because the potentiated effect is, was taken away when they stopped taking the barbiturate. Does that make sense to you? 
So while this patient is intubated and sedated, they're taking this drug called a barbiturate. And the barbiturate is a paralytic. We paralyze patients when they are intubated so they don't pull it out. Um, that kind of thing, right? While they're taking the barbiturate, the metabolism of Coumadin is increased. So they go through a lot of Coumadin. So in order to get them at a therapeutic level, we're giving them more and more Coumadin. But then, they're, so they're a therapeutic level, but then we extubate them. They're not taking the barbiturate anymore. The effect of the barbiturate is still in their body because of the half-life of the drug. Then, all of a sudden, the dose of Coumadin that we were giving them, so for six days they were ventilated, right? And then for four days they were still in the hospital. Those four days, the barbiturate might have still been in the system due to half-life. By the 10th day, they're going home. We need to think about decreasing that dose of Coumadin because it's not going to be highly metabolized anymore. Okay? Confusing, but you go okay? Got it? So some foods can increase or decrease the um, rate of absorption. And the classic example in your book is tetracyclines. They bind to calcium, so you don't want to take tetracycline with calcium-containing foods, or the patient's not going to get the drug, right? So that's a teaching piece. And you need to know what taking on an empty stomach means. So make sure you do know one hour before or two hours after taking a medication constitutes on an empty stomach. You're going to be answering that question for a long time. I have people text me and call me all the time still. You know, family, they want the free advice. Do y'all get that yet? Oh, you're in nursing school, you must know this. Yeah, tell them not yet. Or be careful who you give advice to, make sure they won't sue you. A very important drug or food to think about is grapefruit juice. It has a specific isoenzyme in it that prevents um, breakdown of certain drugs. And so specifically, it um, can cause hypertension and excessive hypertension. So we really want to make sure that patients who take medications just say no grapefruit juice. And we kind of do that for all patients, um, even though we could do it for specific kinds of patients. Okay, so it's just a good thing for you to think about. Grapefruit juice is no in nursing. No, 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 no. Some foods can cause increased toxicity. The monoamine oxidase inhibitors are a class of drugs used to treat depression and um, bipolar disorder. Those drugs cannot be taken with tyramine-rich foods. It's already time to stop. Oh. Everybody set their alarm. <laughs> like, oh, let, me finish, let me finish tyramine-rich foods and then we'll go on. You have to know these foods, so put these foods in your head. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors aren't given super often but this will be on your nursing boards in two years, guarantee it. So go ahead and know it now and remember it. Avoid tyramine-rich foods. That means you have to be able to teach your patient which foods to avoid. So I would give you a list of foods, like hot dog and chicken breast and broccoli and some banana. Which one should you not give? Hot dog, hot dog right? It's that processed meat. Okay, that's the kind of question you could anticipate for that. Okay, so we're going to talk about adverse drug reactions. Um, do you guys know these terms yet? Mm -hmm. Yes, hopefully you do. So a side effect is unpleasant. Look, I'm trying to write on this. <laughs> this is my finger. Would you like a stylus? My stylus doesn't work well. Let me try yours. I like this. <laughs> so toxicity is what? I heard it excessive, excessive dosing. I didn't spell that right. Excessive dosing that leads to adverse effects. So a toxicity is excessive dosing that leads to adverse effects. I know this is sad. I'll work on it. Um, so this could be the example like morphine or an opioid overdose, because then the patient, um, it works at normal levels. 
if you take the drug as prescribed, but at excessive levels, you could become toxic. Allergic reaction is what? Immune response is the key word. Oh, I can't write. Okay, what's your question? Said you had to have it already in your body before. Mm -hmm. So you can have a drug and not have any response to it at all because your body's never had it before. And then the next time you have it, you can have like the worst allergic reaction to it. Absolutely. First time, it first time is nothing because your body hasn't recognized it yet. Right. So the first time you take it, your body looks at it and says, I'll keep an eye on you. And the second time you, the body sees it, they say, Oh, I know you're not part of me now. I'm going to attack you. Okay. Right? It's like a little army. Like when little babies like eat something for the first time, they like get sick first. Like it's like immediate. Mm -hmm. Or do they always just eat it twice before you actually notice? You have to get it at least twice before you actually notice. You could take it 15 times, and the 16th time is the time you have a reaction. Okay, so that's part of it. What makes it an immune response and not a side effect is that the the actual immune system has responded. So you've got swelling, you've got redness, you've got a rash. You've got fever, something like that. Whereas if it's just a side effect, maybe you're a little nauseated, you've got a little diarrhea, it's a little unpleasant, but you're not, you know, your body's not actually responding in a bad way. So does that have to do, like, would it be with doses? Like if you're taking like an antibiotic, you're allergic, it would be like the second dose? Or like right, so it would be like, the, you would, it could be the second dose. So the first time you take it today, mm -hmm. you might be fine, but you take it tonight and you have a reaction. It could be that you took a whole, a whole course of antibiotic last month and didn't have a reaction and started it again this month for something, and you do. Okay, so you're always going to teach your patient to monitor for that side effect or allergic reaction. And if you give a drug, what should you do? Monitor. Um, sorry, can you give a couple examples of a side effect versus an allergic reaction? Yeah, so the classic side effect is GI distress. So if you listen to any drug commercials on TV, they list off 150 things, but always is like upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, right? Um, but the allergic reaction is swelling of the lips and tongue. You might have heard that on some drug um, commercials. Rash, itching, that kind of thing. So think of a bug bite. That's a good re allergic reaction, right? You get a bug bite, it gets red, it gets itchy. You've got histamine inside your body going to that site, causing the redness, swelling, and all of that. And it, the, the body's trying to attempt to partition it off so it, uh, it stays there and doesn't go anywhere else. And when you take the drug, the body's reacting like that, even though it's not actually an allergen, OK? Does that make better sense to think of it like a bug bite? What's idiosyncratic? Kind of something unique, something we don't expect. It's got a genetic component, right? Um, and I can't really have examples of this. I've never seen really an idiosyncratic effect, which is good. Iatrogenic, what does that mean? It's produced by drugs. Kind of produced by, it's produced by medical care. So um, the patient wasn't sick until we treated them, and now they're sick. drugs. I consider that medical treatment. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. And physical dependence. Addiction is, a, is one word you could use for it. Tolerance is a word that we like to use for it because it's a little bit different than addiction. So tolerance means that your body has become used to the drug and when you take the drug away, you develop an abstinence syndrome. You can develop an abstinence syndrome on drugs that are not narcotics. So addiction is a little bit different. Addiction is also a psychological component as well as a physical component. So physical dependence here is that tolerance. More and more doses to get the same effect. If I take the drug away, I feel jittery, I feel bad, have abstinence syndrome. Okay. Carcinogenic effect is cause cancer. The abbreviation for cancer is CA. Tricky, huh? And teratogenic, birth defects. 
and your book says that it causes a specific amount of defect within the first nine weeks to be called teratogenic. Other books will tell you it, if it causes a birth defect at all, it's teratogenic. Um, so I, what I need you to know is to think every time a pregnant person is taking a drug, check it to see if it's teratogenic, regardless of level of pregnancy. Okay. Conception, conception, yeah. So after the baby's born, we're more worried about breastfeeding and sending the drug out that way. With the teratogenic effect, isn't it that certain birth defects happen, can happen at different stages, like the first nine weeks is when I think what the physical... Yeah, so, so the question is, do, do certain drugs cause a specific um, teratogenic or birth defects? And the, question, the answer is yes, they do. Um, and if, it, if the drug uh, causes the effect within the first nine weeks, it causes a um, physical defect, like cleft lip, cleft palate. If it occurs after nine weeks, it generally, it, it can include some physical defect, but typically a more functional defect, like cerebral palsy or something like that. Okay. There's a great chart in your book that actually describes that. And I used to get... Okay, so we have to talk a little bit about lab work. Um, and so we know that some drugs can affect excretion and some drugs can affect <coughs> metabolism. And so since drugs do affect those things, we have to monitor the organs that are involved. So what lab work would you check if you wanted to monitor kidneys? So the answer is a BUN, blood urea nitrogen, and creatinine. Those are your two blood tests. They're very common blood tests. They're on your list of labs to know. Um, for this test, you don't have to know the exact value, but you need to start getting familiar with them. Um, as a little tip, don't say bun. Doctors won't take you seriously if you say the bun's 42. <laughs> it's a BUN, okay? I've heard nurses say that. I'm like, no, don't do it. <laughs> I feel like nurses are always fighting for respect anyway. Don't give them any ammunition. Um, so liver disease is a really tricky test. It's called liver function test. <laughs> LFTs. Within the LFTs, there's two tests, but I'm not going to have you um, know exactly what those are right now. But make sure that when you're looking at drugs, you look at the patient's lab work. Look at the BUN and creatinine. Look at the LFTs. See what they are. If they're abnormally high, look at their drugs that they're on. See if there's any problems potentially. Because you might be the first person to note it to call the doctor to get them off the drug. Okay? So, we'll go to Socrative again. Last semester I was doing this lecture and one of the students held up their hand in the back of the room and said, why are you going over medication errors? Does this really happen? Well, yeah, it does, unfortunately. A thousand deaths a day due to medication errors. 10,000 injuries a day due to medication errors. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. How many of you have ever worked in a hospital? Is it chaotic? Right, and it's pretty chaotic. The drugs are supposed to be in the patient's room. They might not be, they may be. You gotta get some out of the refrigerator, some out of the Pixis. Some aren't there, you have to call a pharmacy. You got the wrong dose, you got the wrong whatever. And four people are calling your, on the call bell, your phone's ringing, you got a lot of stuff happening. Errors happen. Um, so we're trying to put in place, systems things in place to stop errors. And armbands and scanning armbands is one way to do that. I want to warn you not to rely on armband scanning. It does work if it's, if it's all coded correctly. But still, do a verbal name and date of birth check, even if you've had that one patient all day as a student nurse. Every time you do it, check their name and date of birth. If your patient is in the ICU and they're comatose and they got a ventilator and they can't talk to you, say it out loud. 
when the people who inspect hospitals, the Joint Commission, comes through to inspect to make sure we're doing best practices, they watch for stuff like that. Are we still doing best practice? So I want you to get into the good habit of doing it, even if you see other people kind of slacking. Um, three co most common types of fatal medication errors. Overdose, wrong drug, wrong route. So I worked with this nurse one time who gave, who had at least two medication errors that I know about. One was she gave IV potassium instead of IV Lasix. Because at that time, we drew up our own medications in the medication room, and the bottles looked pretty similar, and if you were in a hurry, you just did it. And there was potassium just like laying out everywhere. You just grabbed it. We know that's unsafe now, and so now the pharmacy is the only person who has those drugs. But the nurse didn't admit to her error. The patient kept complaining that her arm was burning. It wasn't until the patient had cardiac arrest that we knew there was a problem, okay? But that nurse didn't get fired. She did get fired after the next one, though. Did she know that she committed the... I think she, I mean, yeah. I mean, after a while of practicing, you know that potassium burns. You know, you know, you know the signs, so. The next error she made was actually not on my patient, thank goodness, it was on someone else's patient. But, <laughs> well, you feel some sense of, of like, you know, that's my patient. You know, I don't want anything, you know, your pride or whatever. Well, my patients have the best care. Your patients I know about. <laughs> but my, the doctor called in, and the patient had a problem with blood pressure, and the doctor said, give 10 milligrams of lotensin PO. And the um, nurse heard 10 milligrams, but then she pulled up the wrong drug. And so that drug, the, the dosing was different. The potency was different. So 10 milligrams of this other drug was much more potent. And so the patient actually crashed. This one lived, fortunately, but they had to be put on support, ventilator support. They had to be put on IV pressors to keep their blood pressure up and perfusing their body. It was a really big deal. Um, and it happens really quickly. You know, you think you see the drug, you think you know the drug, but these errors happen. So double check, triple check, just keep checking, checking, checking. Um, the most common causes of fatal errors is communication. So in the second case I gave you, it was a verbal order, and the nurse wrote it down wrong or remembered it wrong or whatever. Confusion by similarities in drug names is very common. Um, phenytoin and what is the other drug? Phenytoin and phenobarbital are pretty similar. There's a bunch of drugs that are pretty similar. So you want, always want to clarify what's going on with your medications. And you've already answered that. So let's move on. Talked about that. Okay, bioavailability is a term you really need to know. And it refers to the ability of a drug to reach systemic circulation and its site of administration. And so when we're going to when we move forward, starting next Tuesday, we're going to talk a lot about um, receptors and agonists and antagonists and how that works. And when I was briefly talking about agonist-antagonist effect earlier with that example of morphine and Narcan, right, we were talking about bioavailability. So when you give the, the antagonist, it blocks those receptor sites, and when it blocks those receptor sites, you have less bioavailability of that particular drug in that particular situation. Okay. Genetic effects, there's some really cool stuff going on with genetics right now. Um, Coumadin is one of the drugs that is, um, genetic testing is becoming recommended for, for dosing. Um, I would say in this area, it's not um, practiced quite yet, but at bigger hospitals, Johns Hopkins and that kind, those kinds of places where they do research and they are a little bit more advanced, with their practice, the, you'll do a genetic test for Coumadin before you dose the patient, and then you know you've got the right dose. You said that the antagonist blocks the receptor sites and then it lowers the bioavailability? In that particular situation of using that morphine and Narcan, that's the way that that particular situation works.
drugs in pregnancy are kind of a big deal, and some of the things that happen in pregnancy are actually a little counterintuitive, especially when it comes to this idea of drug dosing. Um, as placental blood volume increases and glomerular filtration or perfusion of the kidneys increases, you need increased doses of medications to reach therapeutic effect. And a lot of times you might think to yourself, I'm pregnant, I should take a lower dose so it's safer for the fetus, but then it doesn't work. Okay, so then you're looking for that therapeutic window of what, does, what works and what doesn't work. Okay, and so when you're giving medications to someone who is pregnant, you want to check the dosing, make sure it's safe for pregnant people, make sure it's safe um, in terms of the pregnant dose, not just the normal dose. Um, we wanted to think about drugs that cross placenta easily because they were more at risk for drug um, teratogenic effects. So if your drug is ionized, if it's polar, if it's lipid soluble, it can all cross the placenta a little bit easier. If your patient's breastfeeding, so they've had their child, but they need to take a medication every day, when should they take the medication? Right after breastfeeding. That's the correct answer. If you take it before breastfeeding, the, ba the patient or the baby will get um, potentially peak effect of the drug through the breast milk. And we talked about teratogens already. The classic teratogen in history is the thalidomide scandal. Um, patients were t being given thalidomide for a long time until a bunch of women started having babies with birth defects, and they did some research and realized it caused birth defects. The reason things like that happens um, is that we typically have been doing research on males, white males in middle age. And not all of our patients are white males in middle age. And so extrapolating that data to something that, you know, to a pregnant woman was difficult. And we learn through trial and error. So we're doing a little bit better with research to do better for our patients. However, if you're pregnant, are you signing up for my research trial? <laughs> Nobody's signing that up for that. Oh, my fetus, sure. <laughs> I don't care what happens to that fetus. That's not happening. Also, with children, the same kind of thing happens. We don't test on children very often, and so we have to take that data and extrapolate it and do small trials um, for high-risk patients. Make sure you look at the pregnancy risk categories. Um, they're A, B, C, D, X. So X is the worst. A is the best. A and B are typically what you're seeing patients. So A means it's had clinical trials, and there's no harm in humans found. Very few drugs are going to be pregnancy A. Pregnancy category B means there have been lots of trials, and we haven't found any problems in animals. C means we've done some trials, and there have been some problems in animals, but not a lot. D means that they've been done some trials, and there's some problems with animals. And X means it's killed the animals. So we don't want to try it for our humans. Okay. So always look that up. Okay, we're not going to do this activity because I feel like we're getting close on time. But what my idea was that you would go to LexiComp and look up Dilantin or Phenytoin and see is it a teratogen or not. And that's something you would do in clinical practice. Okay, so we'll talk about children and we'll talk about the elderly and then we're going to head out. So children. What do you know about them? They're little adults, right? No? Right? Just t tiny little adults. You treat them exactly the same. No. They have immature systems, especially up until age um, of one year. Immature liver and renal function in particular. So you have to worry about how patients are reacting to the drugs. Infants, meaning children over one month but less than one year, often have intense reaction to drugs. So you have to look up those doses carefully. Drug doses in children are calculated according to weight in kilograms. And so if you had a patient and they said, give, I don't know, give whatever, five milligrams per kilogram, and, but you look at the chart and the weights in pounds, you will have to convert the pounds to kilograms 
and then do the calculation to see how much drug to give. Okay, so make sure you're aware of that. There's no rounding in pediatrics because you want to give them as precise a dose as possible. There is rounding of medications in adults, and the um, rounding rules that you'll learn for MCAST are based on adult dosages, okay? So just FYI there. Sorry, I tend to talk with other slides. Mm -hmm. so, so the elderly, and the elderly is classified as over 65 years of age, and these folks are at higher risk for a lot of drug interactions and adverse drug effects due to some physiologic problems, but also due to some psychosocial problems, also due to the amount of medications they take. So what are some psychosocial problems that could be related to adverse drug regimens and reactions in elderly folks? So maybe they live alone and they have a bad memory and they don't remember to take their drugs. Then they have a drug adherence problem. Maybe you, they do live alone and they take a drug that causes them to get weak and dizzy and they fall down. That's an adverse reaction. That's not good. Older people are more likely to take multiple medications, so it's called polypharmacy. The more medications you take, the more risk you have, right, because of our drug-drug interactions. The physiologic responses that you're worried about for um, elderly people has to do with the increased body fat content, because all of those lipid-soluble drugs that you might give have lots of places to be stored if you have increased body fat, right, so increased toxicity risk. They have decreased lean body mass, so you start losing body mass and muscle as you get older. Increase, when you have a lot of lean body mass, it helps your metabolism and you build up your metabolism with muscle, right? You all know that as you work out, you need more food. You develop more muscle mass, you need more food. Um, but the way it looks for the elderly is that they have decreased lean muscle mass, and so they're not metabolizing drugs as quickly. So they lead, it leads to more toxicity, or risk for toxicity. So it's something you're going to look for. They have increased gastric secretions, decreased gastric mobility. So if you think about increased gastric secretions, it means um, the stomach acids can break down the drug faster. But the decreased mobility means it stays in the stomach longer and it gets absorbed longer. So what does that mean for your patient? So you might hit peak effects sooner. It might not last as long in your patient. All right. So I've talked about liver function and renal function already in the normal adult. Um, for elderly people, they just have higher risk. As you get older, you have decreased function potentially. Um, and so you want to really monitor their lab work. The specific kidney test for the elderly that's better than the two tests I talked to you about previously is a creatinine clearance. Um, it really helps when patients have decreased body mass to determine if they're really holding on and not clearing out toxins with their kidneys. So if I had somebody, if I had an elderly patient and they had um, increased BUN and creatinine, but they didn't look dehydrated and they didn't have any signs of renal failure, and I wondered, well, is this because they really have kidney failure or is it because they have decreased lean body mass? I could get a creatinine clearance test and help me determine if there's really kidney function problems. Okay, that's the end of my talk.